Romanticism. To begin with, we need to consider an important political event that culminated in 1789, the French Revolution. One important consequence of the revolution was the emergence of the modern political idea of the citizen. The revolution died down, but the idea of the citizen did not. It thrived and spread to other states and nations in Europe and to those parts of the world linked to Europe through trade and colonisation. The modern idea of citizenship is paradoxical because on the one hand the state rules that all citizens are equal, while on the other hand the social reality of modernity is that they are not. This is because the social, economic and cultural motor of modernity, sometimes called capitalism, only works if there is an acute and highly polarised difference between real life opportunities and satisfactions, both within and between nation states. A major question for emerging democracies in the late 18th and early 19th centuries was how to reconcile the fundamental contradiction between the ideal of equality and the reality of inequality. Architecture's contributions to these debates tended to fall on the side of the ideal. This is a design for a public library by Etienne Louis Boulet. It was proposed at a time when there was no such thing as a public library in France, or indeed anywhere else in the world. There were libraries, but they were the private collections of important leading figures, or the royal collections of kings. Boulet conceived his public library as a state facility, with the state in turn conceived as a body of free citizens. The public library was to be freely available, as of right, to all citizens. Through its built form, the library was to express the ideal of equality, both as an urban form and as a spatial environment. During the last years of the monarchy, Boulet worked on a whole series of imaginary designs for public buildings. He worked on the library in 1781, a cenotaph to Sir Isaac Newton in 1784, and a proposal for an opera house in 1781, shown in this slide. Boulet wanted to evoke the same feeling for space that had excited neoclassical architects, but he wanted to go even further. Boulet dreamt of a kind of architecture that would filter into the perceptions of the citizens, affecting their nervous systems and inducing what he called sensations. Boulet thought of his designs as being like paintings, and, just as a painting can trigger emotions, so Boulet wanted his architecture to arouse emotions in the crowds of citizens who would populate and use it. The persistence of simple volumetric figures and strong contrasts of light and shade reflect Boulet's belief in the direct relationship between form and human emotion. And he thought these effects were universal, in other words something that every citizen would experience, hence egalitarian. Because they were such astonishing, single-minded statements, so Boulet's designs also implied their opposite, another kind of unsensational architecture that citizens would inhabit when they were not in public. Today, we call it private space. But perhaps the most important thing about Boulet's library is the new attitude to knowledge it implied, because in a public library, knowledge is the property of all citizens, not just the ruling elites. Boulet composed his library out of simple clear elements, an enormous barrel vault ceiling with a single huge skylight, a stepped bank of shelving rising up from the ground with the colonnade between, separating the ceiling from the shelving. Sadly, Boulet's library was never built, but when the first public library was eventually built, his design had a tremendous influence. The first public library is very close to the Church of Saint Genevieve. It even shares the name. It was designed and constructed between 1838 and 1850. Its architect was named Henry Le Bruce. The new library was to house the collection of books that had belonged to the monastery of Saint Genevieve, but were now owned by the state. Le Brust's library shares the same broad compositional strategy as Boulet's. 
The lower level of the room is occupied by a zone of books expressed as a stepped mound with a barrel vaulted ceiling above. Boulet's library has a single vault, the Bruce's has two. The difference points to an important spatial distinction. Whereas the central axis of Boulet's library is an empty space that people could walk along, in the Bruce's it's occupied by a colonnade of slender iron columns resting on plinths. Between the plinths there are back-to-back -back shelving units designed so that the total assembly of plinths and shelves reads as a single wall. The plinth shelf device runs the entire length of the room and in so doing it physically negates and yet at the same time it visually states the possibility of procession along that central axis. Le Brust wanted to stress the secular nature of the library and its specifically modern character as a place where knowledge was to be pursued by means of objective study, research and critical reflection. For him, the central axis meant procession and ritual, which is why the architecture both states and denies it. Le Brust's approach to the design of Paris's first public library was unique in his day. He conceived the design problem to be a duality made up of questions of logic and building on the one hand and of symbolism and communication on the other. It is this dual logic communicative approach to design that we refer to by the term romantic. From the logical position, Le Brust studied issues of book storage and delivery. He investigated the possibilities of new technologies and materials, including systems of ventilation, heating and gas lighting. But the most conspicuous technical innovation was the device of the interior ironwork frame. When Le Bruce submitted the preliminary drawings for approval by the Civil Building Council, he was asked to reconsider the iron frame and substitute a stone one instead. He fended off the criticism by pointing out that an interior iron frame meant the exterior walls could be much more open than would be the case with the masonry frame, and this would result in a more generous and even distribution of light inside the building. Another point in favour of the iron frame was that it could be fabricated off-site, in parallel with the on-site work going on, thereby reducing construction time and costs. From his second position, where the building is understood as a medium of communication, Le Brust thought about readability. He wanted to treat the building as if it were a kind of message and memento for the citizens who owned and would use it. In order for anything to be readable, it has to be systematic and articulated. The most obvious articulations of Le Brust's library are in its rectangular, box-like form. Even someone new to reading buildings must notice the two-part articulation of the box. First, a walled plinth rising up from the ground, and second, perched on top of it, a continuous arcaded wall running around the entire building on all four sides. Looking a little more closely, we see a further articulation between the two parts, a continuous band of stone called a levelling course. The articulation of the box on the outside into two levels is reflected on the inside through the division into two floors. The upper floor houses the main library space, the reading room. The lower floor houses secondary spaces such as storage and specialist reading rooms and it includes the entrance lobby. The entrance to the library is where you would expect to find it, on the ground floor in the middle of the box. The articulations of the box filter down to the details of the building too. Notice how the bays of the arcade are articulated as two distinct zones, above and below. Each arch emerges as an open figure above, while below it's filled in with an opaque material, stone in fact. The zone of opaque material masks the tiered system of bookshelves lining the reading room inside. The names of important authors are carved into the exterior infill panels, celebrating the reading room and the books on the inside. Le Bruce liked to refer to this feature as being like a monumental catalogue, and he liked to think of the image of the books on the inside as contributing to the readability of the library too, 
referring to them as the most beautiful ornaments of the interior. There are void spaces built into the bookshelves. They function as small storage rooms. On the outside, the voids are signalled as a line of tiny openings located just above the levelling course, one for each bay. Even the interior ironwork is signalled on the exterior. The two ranges of circular iron plates mark the location of iron tie rods on the outside. On the lower level, the iron plates appear to support a carved garland running all the way around the building, appearing to hang down from the levelling course. The entrance reads as a simple archway opened up within the walled plinth. The garland runs across it. Le Brust's design of architectural ornament reflects an entirely different attitude to that of neoclassical architects like Soufflot, Leroy and even Boulay. Rather than imposing conventional ornaments derived from antiquity, Le Brust invented an entirely new approach. Broadly speaking, there are two levels to his strategy. First, the parts of the building are articulated as discrete elements, and second, the programme of the building, its function and organisation, is given symbolic expression in those articulated forms. The word that was sometimes used to refer to this approach to ornament is transparency. It's worth pausing here to think a little more about transparency, because it's a word that we use today, but in a very different sense. Today, we use transparency to mean a building whose insides are visible on the outside. The technology that makes this kind of literal transparency possible is plate glass. Le Brust's library is obviously not transparent in that sense. The viewer can't literally look inside the building. The transparency of Le Brust's library is closer to the kind of transparency we rely on when we speak. When we speak, we use sounds to stand in for things that are not sounds. For example, the sound tree to stand for an idea, a concept or an image of a tree. And when we talk, we tend to focus on the meanings and not the sounds of the words. Equipped with this speech-based notion of transparency, let's now revisit the interior. Moving from the entrance to the reading room requires the visitor pass through a lobby space and then up a stairway. The lobby is a relatively dark space occupied by a field of freestanding columns. The columns are rectangular and made of stone. They have no base and refer to no particular order. They are mirrored on the walls as pilasters. The columns and pilasters terminate in a network of slender iron trusses. As you can see, these look too light and insubstantial to justify the mass and solidity of the supporting columns. If this looks odd to us today, imagine how odd it must have appeared back in 1850 when the library first opened. For people who were not yet familiar with ironwork as a structural material, the appearance of the lobby was quite unsettling, as one visitor wrote. By the manner in which these two so different materials, stone and iron, are juxtaposed and united, the pier appears heavy and the arch fragile. There is something shocking in seeing so much strength expended in supporting so little. We are perfectly aware of the objections one might make about the comparative strength of the two materials, but it must not be forgotten that everything true is not always beautiful and that what is solid and sufficient materially might not satisfy the eyes. One sees and feels before one reasons, and more quickly than one reasons. Thus it is necessary, after having calculated solidity mathematically, to calculate with less precision the impression the form might produce. This rule has not been sufficiently observed in the detail we have just cited. The question of whether or not the visitor enjoys the lobby space is of fleeting concern because they quickly pass through it and up the stairway into the reading room. On ascending into the reading room, the linear box-like form of the building reappears, only now the visitor experiences it volumetrically as an environment rather than a building in open city space. On the inside, the perimeter arcade reveals its full depth. 
Notice how the device of the tiered bookshelves backs into that depth, pressing up against the veiling screen that carries the monumental catalogue displayed on the outside. But the most striking feature of the room is the iron armature of slender columns and arches. Notice how the delicate lightness of the ironwork complements the depth of the arcade. Intuitively, one might suppose the deep arcaded wall resists an outward thrust exerted by the arches of the iron armature, but that is not so. Although the iron armature looks like a pair of barrel vaults, the structural facts are different. The iron armature is made from large cast iron sections bolted together. Structurally, it's a series of lateral cantilevers balanced on the row of columns running down the centre of the room. The white panels that look like stonework filling in between the ironwork are just a lightweight webbing of thin plasterwork. The tiny corbels jutting out from the sides of the arcaded wall are just stabilisers, they have no bearing roll. This means the external wall carries no load other than its own weight. Notice the proportions of the arcade piers. They are very deep but relatively narrow. This means they act as louvres, breaking the sunlight and diffusing it between their flat, unadorned sides. The same kinds of logical reasons can be adduced to explain why the arcade windows are set so close to the outer plane of the façade, and why the ceiling is shaped into half-cylinders and so looks like a vault. At this point, I want you to recollect Boulet's public library design and his speculations about the possibilities of creating a universal architecture of sensations. Boulet's experiments were just drawings on paper. He never confronted the question of how to build. For Le Bruce, things were different. For a start, he already had Boulet's speculative projects to refer to as an inspiration, but he also had new building technologies to work with. Le Bruce took Boulet's ideas very seriously, and he asked about the possibilities of realising them in an actual built form. Because he was using Boulet's ideas critically to help him imagine, so Le Bruce was able to use the new technology of structural ironwork in ways that went beyond mere utilitarian building. And so he was able to create a new kind of architectural environment, one that was more atmospheric than previous architectures had been. One year after the completion of Le Bruce's library, a brand new type of environment appeared in London. It too used a new technology of structural ironwork. It was called the Crystal Palace. The Crystal Palace was of a size and scale to compete with Boulet's architecture of sensations, but it was conceived in an altogether different spirit. Earlier on, I talked about two different notions of transparency. I said Le Bruce's library exhibited a kind of blind transparency, rather like speech, where the interior of a building is communicated but not literally seen on the outside. And I mentioned literal transparency, which is the kind of transparency we experience when we construct using glass and the inside is visible on the outside. The Crystal Palace was transparent in the literal sense. In the mid-19th century, no one had yet thought of associating literal transparency with architecture. In those days, to count as architecture, a building had to exhibit blind transparency, not literal. The Crystal Palace belonged to a new idea for making buildings that was associated with landscape gardening and had begun in the 18th century through the fabrication of greenhouses. The designer of the Crystal Palace, Joseph Paxton, had developed a greenhouse system through a series of designs for Chatsworth House, the Duke of Devonshire's estate in Derbyshire. The most influential of Paxton's greenhouses was the giant lily house that he devised and built just one year before receiving the Crystal Palace Commission. Unlike the Bruce's library, which was conceived as a fixed object in space, the Crystal Palace was conceived as a process. The process took nine months to complete, passing through a series of stages from initial conception to fabrication. It included the manufacture of 6,024 cast iron columns, 1,245 wrought iron girders, 
a 900,000 square feet of glass in separate panes measuring 49 inches long and their delivery and assembly on site. Hollow cast iron columns doubled as drain pipes and horizontal members at top and bottom acted as gutters. The same gutters were used as tracks to run small iron carts used by the roof glaziers to insert glass panels into the iron frame. Condensation was solved by dividing the glass panels into sloping surfaces that carried water off to the gutters and so stopped it dripping through to the interior. The assembly resulted in a total form that was 1,851 feet long, that's 564 metres, and 450 feet wide. It enclosed a record break in 18 acres in an interior space free of internal walls. At the close of the exhibition, the entire assembly was taken down and moved elsewhere. Although the technical achievement of the Crystal Palace was impressive, an equally important consequence were the emotive effects it gave rise to. The emotions were only partly due to the novelty of iron and glass. What really impressed the visitors was the relationship between the relatively small size and repetition of the individual building components and the enormous size of the total volume of space, which was impossible to take in at one glance. As one observer explained, we see a delicate network of lines without any clue by means of which we might judge their distance from the eye or the real size. The side walls are too far apart to be embraced in a single glance. Instead of moving from the wall at one end to that of the other, the eye sweeps along an unending perspective which fades into the horizon. We cannot tell if this structure towers a hundred or a thousand feet above us, or whether the roof is a flat platform or is built up as a succession of ridges, for there is no play of shadows to enable our optic nerves to gauge the measurements. If we let our gaze travel downward, it encounters the blue painted lattice girders. At first these occur only at wide intervals, then they range closer and closer together until they are interrupted by a dazzling band of light, the transept, which dissolves into a distant background where all materiality is blended into an atmosphere. Recollect Boulet. He was merely fantasising about sensational architecture. The creators of the Crystal Palace had actually made it a reality. But what is most astonishing about the Crystal Palace effect is that it was never conceived in the mind of an architect. It arose spontaneously as a kind of by-product of a mechanical process of manufacture and assembly. The new space came as a complete surprise to everybody, including the architects. The question of how to respond to sensational space was especially difficult for architects. One response took the form of a movement known as the Arts and Crafts. Next week's lecture will look at the way architecture became involved in the Arts and Crafts movement and how it was able to put up a resistance to the problematics of sensational space.